Hey, what's up, everybody? We are uh, we're going live. I am in the midst of trying to log into Facebook as well. See if this works. So there was a discussion of do we go Instagram live? Do we do Facebook live? And I think Facebook live is working. Can't really tell. Um, but we're trying to do both at the same time. Why do either or? I've got two phones. Facebook, meet Instagram. Instagram, meet Facebook. <sighs> Appreciate Seem like I have a bad connection on Instagram here. I'm not sure if Facebook is happening. But Instagram is definitely happening. Well, if someone who has access to Facebook and Instagram can just let me know um, if Facebook is happening. It looks like it's not. It says live, but it doesn't seem like uh, much things are happening. So I don't know. So I'll focus on Instagram right now. That's, that's the way it should be probably, right? Um, how are you guys doing? See some comments coming in. Hello. Good to see you guys. Welcome. Welcome to my creative space that I uh, just got rid of. Uh, well, I just took out a lot of the, the clutter and the instruments that I had more access to some of the instruments that I just need. Well, well, well. Happy New Year. Hope you guys had a great holiday. So much, uh, so much going on. So much uh, has happened in the past year. It was about a year ago, this time when I put out the Everything New video of uh, remaking that song. And um, there was a few things that led to it and why that even happened. I was in the middle of working on the Play Dead Live project that I was planning to do when we came off a tour in 2017. Uh, I spent most of the holidays kind of just going through the tracks and was thinking we were going to do a Play Dead Live album. And for the first time, I was able to start reflecting on what had just happened in 2017. And suddenly the picture of Mute Math had just shifted. And what did that really mean now that I had a chance to breathe? Um, and... I think I started feeling this dark cloud over um, what was play dead at that time and I needed to get away from it. So it was not a healthy thing for me to be drudging up all these play dead live songs. And you know what? And it's a routine I had been in for so long, probably for 13, 15 years. We'd go do a tour, we'd record it, I'd come back and put together a live project of some sort. And I think I was just burnt out on it. Um, but I was pushing through. I was trying to make it happen. And, uh, you know, everyone played great. Hutch, Jonathan, Todd. It was, it was a really good sounding show. And I realized that the one song that we did not play on that tour from the album was Everything New. And the idea that came to me was to possibly do a remake of it. And include it as a bonus track with the Play Dead Live thing. And then all the songs would be covered. And so I started messing with it. And at the time, I was watching a lot of live looping videos. There were some artists that were doing it that was grabbing my attention. I was like, what is going on? How? Are... I've not quite seen it done with sort of this hands-free approach. And I started researching and, and trying to figure out who's doing this. It looked really creatively alluring to me. And as I was messing around with different chord structures for everything new, I was thinking about this live looping thing. I started realizing everyone's kind of using Ableton, and I had Ableton, and so I started trying to explore how to pull that off. And I'm not really an Ableton guy. I really work in Logic. That's where I'm most comfortable. Um, and so through a makeshift way, I started figuring out how to do very simple looping in Ableton, and the idea of doing some sort of remake of everything new within that context got really exciting to me. Um, and the thing that I enjoyed most about trying the looping medium was that it created rules. 
and it was exciting rules because you could only arrange a song in a way that everything had to have a moment to be executed. So, and I'd never really done anything like that. So the drums and the guitar part can't come in at the same time. You're going to have to find a way to get the drum part established. And you can let it go away and come back with a guitar part. But you got to play by those rules. And so that became a lot of fun. And so I just kind of checked out and was messing around with um, just... And I don't know why that song was so inspiring at the time. I think it was probably a lot to do with the uh, the context um, and going into a new year and just the meaning that those lyrics suddenly had to me. And I I had a great time trying to figure out um, how to pull that off. And I learned, I had a crash course in Ableton, the live looping. Um, and what I was doing is I was mainly recording it in Logic, looping one simple thing, which was the drums in Ableton, and then running it all through the 2480 so I could monitor it. And I thought it would be a... The, the way I wanted to work back was I want to set up everything out of the storage unit. I brought it all in uh, to my studio space, and I plugged it all in. I said, what I want to have happen is at any point when I play a keyboard, sing a vocal, play a drum beat, play a bass part, it can loop or it cannot loop. I have that option. And I don't have to uh, be bogged down with doing um, a trigger point for everything. I was seeing artists do this on YouTube and I couldn't figure out exactly how they were doing it. And, and I couldn't really find the software to really pull it off. But creating within that context of Everything has to be played at least once in order to be looped at some point uh, was the creative exercise that I took for everything new. After going through that, probably a, a month later, I forgot everything I had learned in Ableton. Um, so don't do it regularly. It was a crash course, like studying for the exam the night before. And it wasn't really doing what I was hoping to do anyway. Um, and at the time, I started working more with Tyler on Trench, and, and that became more of a focus of, of what was happening at the beginning of the year there, which we'll talk more about in a little bit. And then, this is, a lot of you asking, well, how am I doing the live loop? And that's one of the questions uh, that was going on. And I'm going to introduce you what I found. And this is what I started using for Voice in the Silence, because I, I felt like the universe was hearing what I was hoping to have happen. I either didn't have the interface, I was missing equipment in order to really pull it off with Ableton. I, and this software doesn't really pull off what I'm hoping to ultimately do, but it comes closer. And this is a something, I'm gonna just show you this, it's called Zen Audio. Zen Audio ALK2. How do you do, recommend this software and I'm still trying to figure out all the nuances of it but it's a beautiful thing check this out so what you do is it's it's called live looping arranging Zen Audio ALK2 and I feel like this was just released last year I found out about it in the summer and I started looking into it and it's so much more user-friendly so what you do is you have to map out your whole song, which I was doing anyway, and you gotta figure out each part of it that you wanna have happen on the front end. And being able to live loop with a grid, with multiple inputs, with the option to loop any part of it or not, or just pass through, this software came the closest. So right here, you have an arrangement of a song. This is just a little test of Voice in the Silence. And you show a point. Can you see that? What am I showing? I'm a, uh, maybe. So you see, you tell it to record, and then it loops automatically, right? So like this is the, uh, this is the first sample. So one. Once I'm pressing just a little bit, I got it over here. But look at this. I'm going to try to do this with one hand. 
Okay. This loop right there. And you can arrange it to go away. You can say, ah, I want it to. And it'll drop out for that, and you can come back later on. Uh, and then, like, when the bass line comes in, I'll record that. It goes away. I'll bring in, I'll play the chorus bass line. It'll loop the chorus bass line. And then go back to the verse bass line that I just flew the loop from over here. Um, and another great thing about it, for the MIDI for you. So if your <laughs> execution is less than perfect um, in those MIDI uh, executions, it takes that information and quantizes it the very next loop. That's a huge advantage. That's a huge advantage to being able to um, create and try and find that perfect take or at least close to it. So I need to know, is the connection a bummer? Ugh. I just turned off the Facebook thing. I'm, oh, it was working. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, that's a bummer. Sorry, Facebook. I left you on the sidelines there. So we'll get we'll get more into that as we go. Let's talk about trench. Want to talk about trench? What happened there? Well, Tyler started sending me some ideas. You know, we had we had stayed in touch obviously since the tour, um, and then you know he went on hiatus um, after the tour to Columbus. And as he got set up in his new space, uh, he began to send me some ideas to check out, which were really exciting. And I wasn't really sure if there was a role to be had. Um, I was just really stoked to be hearing things and just reacting to them for him, however that could help. Uh, a lot of people want to know how did that happen? Uh, what did my role become? And I feel like the best way I can describe my role in Trench is I will create a football analogy, which is going to be happening probably a lot on this. Um, football is pretty exciting right now. Who dat? Saints are uh, doing really good. Uh, so I'm going to give you a football <laughs> analogy. I felt like my role was anything from being a cheerleader to getting to participate in the coaching staff. And then when need be, I could put on a helmet and go run a few plays, uh, ad advance the ball a little bit, throw a few blocks, uh, help reestablish the passing game for Tyler, uh, who is obviously the quarterback and um, we'll make Josh the star wide receiver in this analogy, who does um, fantastic end zone <laughs> celebrations. And so anything from a cheerleader to just ground and pound to help move the ball forward, to just keep things moving. And uh, if we hit a wall, um, I would try to just do whatever I could to help uh, find the gaps. And so what turned... Uh, the first song we worked on was Jumpsuit. And then what turned into then three songs, turned into four, then five. And then uh, Tyler finally called me in the spring of last year and said, man, let's just do all 14 like this. And I was elated. I was so excited. I mean, it was probably on an Instagram Live not too long ago. It was right when I heard Blurry Face. I remember I was raving about the band. And someone told me, at that point that I would get to be a part of the follow-up. Um, I wouldn't have believed them. I would have been very stoked about it. So, man, it was just an incredible uh, thing to get to be a part of. And I uh, had a great time. And I, I think the particulars of um, what was done, I, I feel like I had... <laughs> Looking at reaction videos are, are really fun. I, I feel like um, if I were going to ca categorize uh, Tyler's contribution, if you find yourself listening to the album and, you know, you're like, oh, wow, those those feelings of elation like that, that's Tyler. 
It's all Tyler. If you feel yourself going, if you ever get a reaction, it's kind of, I like to claim that one. That'll be me. I was supposed to bring that reaction. Josh, Josh's job would have been if you go, uh, okay, 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 Mr. Drummer. There you go. And I, I think between those things, <laughs> we made an album that uh, I feel we're, we're all very proud of. And so um, thank you guys for all the kind things that were being said and sent my way once that came out and the news was was out. And then I took it upon myself to uh, to try making an album of some sort, some sort of, I didn't know what I was going to do working off of this everything new that happened. But it felt like there was a, it was a new plane to explore. And I wanted to put out a project that went there. And as Mute Math had met a certain fate by the end of 2017, I, I then started asking myself, well, what do I do with this thing that I've been left with, that I have now? Um, and there was certainly no shortage of opinions um, what would be the best thing to do. But I really needed a chance to figure out what is it that I feel is right to do now artistically as a songwriter? What do I want to say? And I think the first question I'd ask myself is like, well, what is mute math? What does that even mean? Should, should that this thing just be buried? Is it, is it overdue? And the answer I came up with, obviously, was no. And I'll tell you why. I think it's going to be a process for me to really explain why. But I began, after I did the Everything New video, and I began to explore more songs to write and perform and try to go further creatively in where I'd started there, the idea of messing with Voice in the Silence came to me. And that song, the DNA of it was... You know, it's from back in 06, and we had played it live a few times, and we just hit walls with that song. We could never figure out how to crack the code on it. Every demo we did was just very uninspired, and it worked live, kind of. But I think part of it was I, I never could quite figure out the lyrics, what it was about. I just had this hook, voice in the silence, and a few lyrics that kind of worked. And I wasn't sure on the messaging of it, and we couldn't figure out an arrangement that felt right in record form. So, but this looping, the rules and the parameters I was talking about, all of a sudden began to just open up the possibilities. And the song was almost, it started as a construction of loops. You had that sample that comes in, you have the um, other sample, the bass line and the beat. So it, it kind of stair steps in its DNA anyway. So I was like, well, let me just go with that and see where it leads me. And it became a really therapeutic exercise to go through a long lost forgotten song and breathe something now into it. And I began to realize that there was something in the embers of the aftermath of, of Mute Math being drastically changed and gone even, if you will, that still felt essential, still felt important to me, just starting there. And I, and I knew that it wasn't to be buried for me. It was to be reshaped. Um, and I wanted to give that a chance. And, I, and then I began, as I began to look at other songs that had been left along the way, it was the same sort of thing. It was songs that didn't make sense in 06, 07. And a lot of these songs on the Voice in the Silence EP are from what we thought was going to be the follow-up to the debut and going into Armistice. And a lot of these were the ones that we shelved and we kind of just thought, oh, this isn't right. And we went ahead and made Armistice. And we re rewrote the whole thing. I'm sure you've heard the stories. We kind of scrapped a record. Well, songs like Kings, Sooner or Later, Voice in the Silence, Work of Art even, um, Hell or High Water, I'm trying to think what else. Distance and Happy to Oblige came a little later, but those, those four or five songs were 
all happening around that time. And that was a very pivotal time for Mute Math as we knew it because it was going to be the last record we did with Greg. Um, it was kind of, I remember very specifically, we moved into that house on Neron and we recorded Armistice. I remember us all sitting down. I said, guys, whatever we can do to just soak this in, we're only here for three months, but this will be our last time as a band to experience this phase of working together. And at the time, Roy and Wendy were pregnant with their first child, it was on the way. And it was gonna, we knew it was gonna be the last time that we could be sort of these, uh, I guess, just the responsibility tiered down from where we were going to just be a bunch of guys that could just move into a house together and make a record. Like our lives were about to grow into different things and they should, you know. Um, and we were all, we all had ambitions to start families and we knew that was gonna be happening within the next three to five years. So that armistice time was a, was a very pivotal time for our band and in our lives even. And when I think back to that personally and I look at some of those songs that were being written, it, it brings me uh, to a place where I'm reminded of all the importance that was surrounding it. And so as I revisit, it all felt like, you know what, I, I want to put this out. Um, and I want to put this out in, in the context of the, the whole journey for me, from songs as early as Work of Art. I mean, Work of Art is one of the first songs I wrote when we started Mute Math. It came with Without It, came with You Are Mine, and Control, like it was in that group of songs. But it was just ill-developed or it just felt like we never quite found how to put the pieces together. Some of you had heard what was a leaked version of it that got on. Well, we tried to record it for the self-titled, but it felt blah. It felt, you know, the, 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 I guess the meat of the song always felt important um, and, and the message of it felt important, but we didn't dress it up right. Um, it, it felt like it became too vanilla and we just felt, ah, we have better songs. We have shelf work of art. Well, it'll see, it'll see another time. Oh, I was bummed when it, when it leaked too. I was like, ah, oh, I guess, well, this is the way it's going to be. And so, and I, I don't feel, so I had half energy to ever go back to it again. I felt like it was already out and but that being said, I always revisited every album to try to find a place to, to say that because I didn't know at the time, but that became a, an Zero integral part. Look at uh, this. Do we go Instagram live, <laughs> Facebook live? Be quiet, Paul. There's my Facebook. I guess it worked. I don't know, should I, should I start Facebook again? Maybe that was a that was just too much to handle. All right, getting distracted with that. I'm just stay focused on Instagram right now. I'm sure this video will go out for other people to see at some point. When we decided that Clockwork was not going to make Armistice, that's when I was I was a little bummed because we worked really hard on Clockwork. But there was a new energy. Dennis Herring had come in to produce, and we wrote Spotlight. And all of a sudden, it was just we got all excited and started running with a different direction. But Clockwork happened. Okay, yeah, Facebook didn't work. All right, we'll let that one go. I wanted the vibe of Clockwork on Armistice, and we, we started getting away from it. And it's like, ah. Uh... And I was going through, at the time, a, a phase where I was really into a band like the editors. I was like, oh, why can't we do something like that? And I remember I started playing guitar even, and, I, and that's when I started learning guitar, was when we were uh, making Armistice and trying to write on guitar. It's like, oh man, I wanna, I wanna wear my guitar really high, do down strums, and let me find, find a way to write some songs where I get to do that. And 
I found one chord. <laughs> it was a D major seven. What was it? It was. Uh, I'm not. I'm not a guitar player. Okay. Uh, it was. It was that chord right there. It's like, all right, well, I can just strum that, right? And uh, I just put a bass line on it. So I tracked myself just strumming that chord and put a bass line on. And I could color it different ways. And it's like, oh, that feels nice. And what I started was I just took one of the million versions of clockwork that we had recorded. And I took the drum take, I chopped it, it's at 150 BPM, and I just brought it over. And um, it's those, it was, it was a rejected clockwork drum take that I built that version of work of art that's on Voice in the Silence right now. I played bass, in the, I played the, uh, played the bass on it, and then I took some of the guitars that uh, Greg had recorded for clockwork and pitched it chopped it and dressed it up to sound a lot like clockwork. I was like, well, maybe there's a, a version of work of art that can, that can be like that. And I had to reimagine the melody a bit and the phrasing because the original version was like around 120 BPM, a different, different key, I think. But it felt nice, uh, but it didn't work. So we let that one go again. And as I was going through different ideas to put on this Voice in the Silence EP, and I heard that work of art, which I hadn't heard in a long time, it just struck me. As I, I've, I've, as I wrote a prophetic lyric from 13, 15 years ago, that right now I'm beginning to feel its relevance. Um, You know, and if, if I had scripted my life, and I would imagine most of us could say this, if you script your life and all the things that you want to have happen and how it should all play out, at some point you realize it didn't go that way. Um, and, and you find yourself at a place where you have to accept that it just may not happen. That particular picture I had in mind did not happen. But what do I have? What is here? And that's, that's the difference between being depressed and being happy and inspired. It's, it's what you do with those feelings. If, if you look at it as a series of mishaps, mistakes, what you should have done, what you could have done, those foster feelings of downer. <laughs> You don't, and it's just draining. You take the same journey that you reflect on and look at, maybe that didn't happen, but this did. And I'm so appreciative of this. And you, and you begin to look at your journey with a sense of appreciation and what is there. That's when the sparks start to happen. And quite honestly, I feel like that is the essence of Mute Math. That is what we had been after the whole time. And it was only recently that I even began to see that. There was a few times, even making Odd Soul, Armistice, where the record company would listen to our record and like, oh, what are y'all making? What are y'all doing? What are we going to do with this? And I remember the president of Warner Brothers, when we played the first version of Odd Soul for him, it was, it wasn't, Odd Soul wasn't even on it. It was, um, it was only like nine or ten songs. And he was like, guys, I feel like I'm just listening to a bunch of songs that you wrote that you think people want to hear. And remember he said something very sobering, which was, you can't expect anyone to care about what you do. And first of all, you don't. In the essence of, you have nothing to say. And it hurt to hear. He's like, what is mute math? What does that even mean? What are you guys are about? Because I'm not getting it. And a lot of that was to provoke me, looking back, you know, that was just a good, good record exec technique of just trying to get me all frothed up and I'll show you and I'm going to write some, write a world changing song. 
but it was more than just a line. It was something I, I really needed to hear. And at the time, we went back another three months and we wrote more songs and I reshaped uh, a lot of the lyrics even. Um, and Blood Pressure became what it became. Odd Soul happened. And we wanted, we realized what we wanted to say was talk more about our context of who we were as people and our story of growing up in Christian America and, and what that meant to us. Because it was something that, if I can be so candid about it, that I struggled with the whole time. Um, I think from when I first signed my record deal, even as Earthsuit, um, and we were bona fide Christian band on a Christian label and trying to find my place in that, which it didn't feel like we found a place and that band wasn't meant to be. And then Mute Math started and we were trying to morph into a new place, but we're still this people. And that was something that Darren and myself certainly bonded over was our, our upbringing. And we shared a lot of the, the similar stories and narrative of our life. And I think trying to figure out how to make art out of that was something we didn't quite ever crack the code on. I saw a question in, in some of the questions that were sent. Why did it never happen for Mute Math? Why was it a band that almost, but it hit a ceiling? And I, I wondered that a lot. I think finally in hindsight, I realized because we didn't understand our context. We didn't know what we really had to say, what we had to offer. Um, and it wasn't until this past year as I reflected on what is Mute Math? You know, I remember when the guy said, you know, how is anyone gonna care about your band if you have nothing to say? I remember my reaction was, but, but I, I play a guitar and, and you know, he, he duct tapes his headphones and, you know, I play a homemade instrument thingy and, um, you know, it, and I started listing off the, the gimmicks or the, the, the auxiliary things that I think we began to falsely put our identity in and what we thought was the meat of what we did. And maybe to a, a lot of you, that still is the meat. Um, but for me in trying to figure out what is mute math and what I'm going to do with it, those couldn't have been the things. And it really wasn't. It was the essence of the songs. What was inside these songs? And at least the best Mute Math songs. And if once I uncover that, if it was worth being buried, then I should bury it or not. When a song like Work of Art said, it's too late. You've already been torn into, it's too late. These are the scars that remind you. Man. There's something, there's something that's being said there. And I felt it was important. It was worth releasing you again. Those of you who had been on this Mute Math journey with me and through the thick and thin and um, when there's nobody at the shows, when there were packed houses, uh, when we had bad gigs, when we had great gigs, what was the thing that kept us unified? And I felt there was a message that we, we bonded over. You know, a song like Kings, which I got some questions about, you know, we had talked about Armistice being this sort of atheistic phase that, you know, we were going through and, and certainly I was and a, a bit rebelling against my upbringing. You, you're going to go through that phase at some point. I feel like um, I probably went through it a little late. I didn't necessarily go through to my college years, more in my late 20s, early 30s. Um, and kind of, yeah, I felt like there was this whole thing in culture, you know, the, the, the atheistic movement that was happening and, and figures like Richard Dawkins and, and their books and Christopher Hitchens, and Sam Harris, and, and just seeing these debates on YouTube and just Christians, just, they, they're wiping the floor. No one can hang with these guys. And... As a Christian, I would take offense to that because I was like, how come we don't have an argument or, or I have this belief system that just can't hang with something that opposes it? And I was reading these books and I, I was putting a lot of what I had thought was my foundational 
thoughts and beliefs for my own life on the witness stand. And that's what armistice really was. And I was wanting to challenge it in front of my bandmates, in front of our audience. And not everyone was excited about it on our team, um, but it was something that I honestly needed to voice. Now, a song like King's got shelved, and I'll tell you why. King's happened in the early Mute Math days when we started touring, and I met this, this wonderful man, and he told me his story. And his story was he grew up in church, much like I did, but he was a pastor's kid. He was as extreme as it gets, and, and meaning... And he, he did everything he was supposed to do. He wasn't a rebellious pastor's kid. He was the guy who went to church every morning. He participated in the choir. He prayed every night. Um, he lived a pure life. It was all about holiness. Um, I mean, he, Ron Luce would have gave him a slow clap. This guy, he, he did the true love waits thing. Uh, he vowed to be celibate until he got married. And, and he did that whole journey. And he wound up marrying... A, another girl who did the same thing in the church and, and they got married as virgins and it was just textbook Christianity. And then they got pregnant with their first child. They had become youth ministers in the church they had grown up with. His father was the pastor. And there was a complication with the birth of what would have been their first child, their daughter, and the complication of the pregnancy led to the mother needing a blood transfusion. And the baby died. They lost the baby. And then the mother became infected with HIV and was in a struggle for her life. And he was telling me this story, God, and how... Every night after he would visit with his dying wife, it was by sheer accident of circumstance that they were even in this predicament. He had lost his newborn, might lose the love of his life. He would go to his church every night and he would yell out to God, beg far, to point out to God that I dedicated my whole life to you. I've asked for nothing. I just need this one thing. Don't take my family from me. Don't let this happen. And he would go visit his wife the next day. And for weeks, he'd, every night, he'd stay up all night and pray, beg God for a miracle. Well, I'm sure you can tell where the story's going. His, his wife died after all that drama. And as I'm speaking to him, I realize I'm not speaking to an atheist. I'm speaking to someone who's still a minister. You know, it's an interesting question when you ask someone, and now I'm just going to, I'm going to rabbit trail a little bit off into this, this God subject, which I don't normally, but here we are. I'm going to do it now. You've not, you've not probably heard this part of me. If you ask someone why they believe in God, or why they don't believe in God, it's usually boiled down to a very personal experience. Either God was there for them in something that they can't explain, so God is real, they believe in it, they dedicate their life to this idea. For someone who doesn't, usually it's because they've faced some disappointment. Um, when they needed God at most, they felt God wasn't there. If it's not because of just being intellectually swayed another way, and it's a hard argument to make um, to convince someone otherwise. But one thing that I realized in this atheistic movement that was happening, I felt like very strong about 10 years ago, was that, you know, a lot of the philosophies were, this whole thing is a myth, and you're an idiot if you believe it. And just turning over the tables, just going into Christian organizations, just saying y'all are a bunch of fools. This is stupid. Stop it. It's childish. with no sensitivity to people whose lives, the fabric of their lives 
are in this journey or in this story of and culture of church and Christianity and this idea of God and relating to someone. And I think a song like King's struggled because the, I remember talking to an NR guy and even guys within the band, like we shouldn't put this out. There's no redemptive quality to it. You know, at some point you've got to say, you, you, you still believe in God after a mishap and a misfortune like that. And I, I wanted to tell this guy's story of, of, um, and I, I related to it in some degree, not to that magnitude, but I think all of us can relate to at some point when we're asking God for something that's against the laws of nature, and it's really important, or we're in the face of a tragedy that has no reasoning. And, and if we've not been exposed to the, the parts of, uh, of humanity these past few years of, of people who are just suffering from losing their family and, and, and unthinkable accidents or tragedies or school shootings and the suffering that's going on. I needed to resolve it in Kings. But what I realized is that the resolve was very much like my friend and his story. Kings is a song that I'm questioning my belief in God by talking to God. I'm telling, I'm telling this to God. I'm, pouring out my anger, my frustration to the only person I have. What happened to this man who lost everything he cared about? Most important thing in, in our lives, if I ask you that, probably going to be family, right? You lose your family. You lose your loved ones, your child. What do you have at that point? And all this guy had was God. Disappointment, baggage, whatever it was, he was just looking for the one thing he could hold on to that was a foundation of something that he could live, continue to, to build a, a life, go forward, take a breath. And he wasn't going to accept that, well, I lost my wife, my, my daughter, there's no God. And I realized that's an important part and it's something that I related to Sometimes when you feel that you're losing everything, you've got to find this one thing that you can, some kind of beauty in the midst of the rubble. Go through the pieces of wreckage and you, and you find um, these cryptic pieces that kind of make a foundation. They kind of fit together. We can build something new here. And if a Mute Math song has been about nothing, at its best, it's about that. It is about... What is the message of a Mute Math song? What is Mute Math at its best? It is songs about dealing, diving into the wreckage. Whatever sort of tragedy, mishap, failure, didn't go as planned. Let's go into the wreckage, find some pieces, something. There is always something that we can build something new. And that's the thing I'm most proud of, of the songs. And I, I wouldn't have known it at the time as we're just writing songs and then in the midst of writing a song like that, we're going to write an Electrify. We're going to... And it wasn't until Vitals going into Play Dead that I began to realize what Mute Math does have to say. What it is that we've been after. And I don't care about the category. At least now I don't. Um, whatever category it falls into. Oh, it's motivational speech rock. It's, uh, it is quasi-Christian. It's whatever it is. It's, it's uh, Whatever unflattering category it falls into, it doesn't matter because that's the thing that gets the creative wheel spinning for me as a songwriter, as someone who wants to even take a stage, uh, wants to sing songs. It is confronting the wreckage, confronting... Um, the problems and believing that there is a way there, there are pieces in there that we can build on and that's what Voice in the Silence was all about that's why I wanted to put it out in the, in the context of Mute Math um, and it was I was literally going through the rubble of Mute Math catalog and songs that were just around and things that felt important to me now and said something that can be built upon. 
And I can tell you this, the project that I do next, um, I'm going to dive into it as a solo project. I'm telling myself I'm not calling it Mute Math because I just want to creatively unbaggage myself from whatever that may be. But who knows what it's going to be called in the end. But I can tell you this, the essence of the songs that I'm going after is embracing that. Um, and I'm really excited about it. And I want to take you guys on the journey with me. Um, I'm going to try to um, let you guys see as the pieces come together uh, and built. I, I know some have asked if I'm planning on touring. Are we doing anything? There's no plans of touring. There's no plans of going out as you've seen us. If there's going to be anything, it's going to be different. The the wreckage field is mass. You know, mute math as it was is gone. But I believe there are a few pieces that will build something beautiful. And that's what I'm after this year. It's 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 one of my big goals and, and what that project is going to say, what it's going to sound like. Really excited to dive into it. And uh, hopefully by 2020 it is out. But I'm sure you'll begin, um, you'll begin to hear some stuff this year. So stay tuned here. Stay with me. Um, I can't thank you enough, everybody, for your for your support that you're even here, that you care to tune in for something like this. And um, I'm really appreciative for what we have. Really appreciate the journey that we um, we got to take together. And all the guys who had been in the certain chapters of, of Mute Math from, from Greg all the way to Hutch in the very end, it was it was an amazing amazing journey, and I think it was it, it's something that that still has life. It's going to be a drastically different life, and I, I can't pinpoint exactly what it's going to be. But it's I'm inviting I'm inviting you to come along. This is going to be fun. This is going to be something exciting. I know it, and I'm going to have a great time uh, unleashing in a new playground in here that we're going to create. And um, we're going to find some good music and we're going to find and I want to find music that when you find yourself in any form of wreckage <laughs> and you're sorting through it, whatever magnitude or, or little thing, whatever it is, these are songs that can be there for you. These are songs. And I, and I feel like knowing some of your stories, they have been along the way. There's going to be more of it. That's what I've been put here to do. And um look forward to continuing on. Love you guys so much. I feel like I've probably talked a long time. I kind of monologued for a while on that. I don't know if I've, let's see, I probably forgot some live looping video where it's a little more in depth and I can like have the camera. Um, so I don't have to try to one hand through this and um, we'll pick up where we left off. Okay. I'll let you guys go. Thank you guys for tuning in. Love y'all. See you.